hello everyone. I think um, you all know me, but in case not, I'm Molly Rideout. I am part of this Artist Impact Coalition. I also work with the Assets for Artists team at MassMoca. Um, and I'm so excited that all of you are here to um, talk and listen to Dr. Hannah Noel Haynes, uh, who's an Associate Professor of Multi-Ethnic Studies and Digital Humanities at MCLA. Um, and Erica is going to do a more in-depth introduction of Hannah in a minute. But before then, um, I just want to orient everybody. Um, if you're able to keep to have your video on, that's great because it kind of creates more of a sense of community while we're still in this pseudo digital moment. Um, and if you can keep yourself muted while Hannah is presenting, that's great. And then um, after the presentation, we're going to um, break into some breakout groups, depending on how many people end up are still here at that moment. Um, we'll kind of figure it out, but probably groups of like five ish is what we're aiming for. Um, and so we'll break out to have kind of smaller conversations um, facilitated by different um, people in the Artist Impact Coalition. Um, and we have a few questions that Hannah has provided us, but we can really just let the conversation go where the group wants, wants it to go. And then after those conversations, we'll come back together and kind of report out to each other of where the conversation went um, and what some, some things that were, you know, especially kind of bubbled to the top and, and felt particularly significant. Um, and real quick, I'll mention this at the end too, but I do want everyone who's here to know that there is um, the Artist Impact Coalition has also started an anti-racism accomplice support group, which is intended for artists or cultural workers in North Berkshires who are looking for peer support as they, you know, learn how to be the most effective ally and accomplice for, you know, the anti-racism work happening in our community and beyond. Um, and so I'm, I'm part of that group and we, there's, I think the whole, almost the whole group is here too. Um, and we meet monthly right now. And so you can sign up to join. Um, it's just a Zoom registration. Um, and I'm dropping that in the chat right now. So feel free to open that up if you would like to learn more about that. Um, and for those of you who are practicing artists, I just want to give like a fast plug for another thing the Artist Impact Coalition is doing right now, which is the new version of the North Adams Project, which pairs um, a grant between one to five thousand dollars with like a lot of kind of community networking and um, like very custom tailored support for you for whatever you want in your creative practice that will like really help you um, kind of put down deep roots in the community, you know, whether like whatever you need um, to be able to like stay and thrive here in North Adams for your practice. Um, and so right now we're accepting applications for that through June 14th. Um, so there's more information about that too. Um, and I think that's all my announcements. So I'm gonna turn it over to Erica to introduce Hannah. Hi everybody, welcome. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce a dear colleague from MCLA. Um, Hannah is an Associate Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies at MCLA and Founding Director of the Minor in Comparative Ethnic Studies. She holds a PhD and an MA in American Culture from the University of Mission, Michigan, Ann Arbor, and a BA in American Studies from Williams College. Her teaching interests focus on the study and advocacy for racial and social justice, including immigrant and refugee rights. Her research interests include critical ethnic studies, Latinx studies, and US immigration history. Hannah has published numerous articles, book chapters, and reviews in critical whiteness studies, Latinx labor history, critical and critical ethnic studies. Her book, Deflective Whiteness and the Coptation of Black and Latinx Identity Politics, is forthcoming in 2021 from Ohio State University Press in their new Race and Mediated Cultures book series, edited by Camila Fulhas and Mary Beltron. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Hannah Noel Haynes. Hannah. 
Thank you, Erica. Um, I, when you were reading that, I just, I, you sometimes as an academic forget how much you talk in jargon and <laughs> I talk a lot in jargon or I wrote a lot for my intro. Um, and I'm gonna be using some terms today. I, I was explaining before I got here that I really like terms that help me make sense of concepts and ideas that I've experienced but didn't know how to articulate prior. I find a lot of agency in that. So I'm gonna be doing some of that today. And I made a PowerPoint, so I'm gonna uh, share my screen with y'all. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to stay around um, 35 minutes. Um, I'll do my best. Uh, so let me see here. Okay. So um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit. Oh, I don't see any faces. One second. I'm not. We have to use um, we have to use Microsoft Teams at MCLA. So it's just taking me a second with Zooms. Um, so my presentation is very much on critical whiteness studies. Um, but it, it, it's also a little bit more expansive. And I did my darndest to also incorporate art throughout the presentation, um, art in terms of um, illustration, art in terms of performance art, uh, and then kind of more classical painting. Um, I tried, I, you all can, can school me after. Um, in terms of a, an agenda for today, um, I like to start off with like a clear map of what my intentions are and then um, so you can kind of gauge where, where I'm at. So I want to start with an introduction of, of who I am and, and what I do and why. Uh, talk a little bit about race and space and this is very much indebted to a conversation I had with Erica. Um, and then talk a little bit about critical whiteness studies, specifically kind of mapping those aha moments within the um, field of critical whiteness studies where I really gain a deeper sense of understanding of my own privilege as a white person within this field. Um, and then a discussion of myths and symbols. So all of my degrees are in uh, American studies and I also have degrees in, in Latinx studies, but um, within American studies, myths and symbols are something that we think about and we study a lot. And I think it's also really relevant to people who produce art and who create art and who study art, um, thinking about these things and, and as well as myth making and ending with breakout rooms. So, um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll get started. So who I am is um, I'm like, I think an eighth or ninth generation Florid Floridian. And by that, I mean Florida Mountain. Um, my, I, I've grown up there and I, I moved back. Um, and so I graduated from Florida elementary school, which is pre-K through eighth grade in 2000. And then I went on to Drury High School. And from there, I got a scholarship to Williams College. And from there, I got a scholarship to the University of Michigan. And I've been teaching um, as a, I taught as a graduate student at Michigan. Um, and then I had my first um, academic appointment at Miami University in Ohio. And I've been at MCLA since uh, 2017. And why I take time to, to mention this is just kind of like, wherever I am and however I approach my work, it's always very rooted in who I am and where I'm from. Um, be growing up working class, really, at, when I map my intellectual awakening, you'll see Marxism is peppered throughout. Um, and a lot of that has to do with growing up working class, um, growing up rural, like in my book, I have um, how, whiteness is a rhetorical construction and how it's um that is uh constructed through song specifically in, in one of my chapters so i'm very much i think a lot about um the spaces in which whiteness becomes legible and i'll, and I'll, I'll say what i mean by that a little bit later um, but i just wanted to introduce myself so i, I teach at mcla and, and i'm from here um, so the first um segment of today's presentation is about race and space. And this is very much indebted to, uh, Erica is extremely generous with her time and wisdom. And she met with me to kind of talk about this presentation, what your goals are as a group. And she mentioned um, kind of this, this idea that made me think and, and made me think about other connections to books. Professors, I think, are just like walking libraries. And so whenever someone mentions something, I'm like, oh, that reminds me of this book. Um, but one of the things that Erica, or a, a comment that Erica made was a lot of people view the Berkshires as a white space, right? And to me, that's really an interesting idea or concept, viewing the Berkshires and Berkshire County 
as a white space and what does that mean? I mean, beyond demographics, right? The demographics would prove that, but specifically what type of ideological work does that do? So what I mean by ideological work, this is something that um, I teach a lot about tropes and stereotypes in, in my courses. Um, and so I always ask my students, like students are really good at picking out stereotypes. They're really good at picking out um, positive, negative stereotypes or tropes. Um, what's a little bit more challenging is thinking about what type of ideological work it does and how do we act on that ideological work. So um, in viewing the Berkshires as a white space, what are we forgetting and what histories are we remembering and how does that impact our current day? Um, so this is kind of what I started thinking about when I was talking to Erica and specifically I mentioned this book that I love. It's so good. Um, so Shabazz has this book, Spatializing Blackness, and there's a couple concepts um, that he brings up. And one is spatialized blackness, and it's so how um, architecture, urban planning, and systems of control function through policing and create a real and figurative prison-like environment. So my favorite chapter in the book, although I love them all, is the chapter Ghost Mapping. So what Shabbat, so brilliant, it's, it's, so what he does is he takes um, back uh, like the 1800s when people were trying to figure out like where was the origin in London for cholera using this um, idea of like mapping disease, but doing this to map uh, Chicago and thinking about the impact of HIV and AIDS in, in, in black Chicago. Um, and how it relates to the prison industrial complex and incarceration, and how incarceration um, impacts and spreads um, and why it spreads. So how this institutionalized racism and lack of, of health um, physically impacts the geography of the city. So this is a very different idea than thinking about spatializing whiteness, but it's why I came up with that idea, right? It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily my, my idea, but it was much like, I was thinking of this book that I thought of. And another thing that Shabazz talks about that a lot of other scholars within critical race theory think about and talk about, I, I in my own work, phrase, use the same concept, but a different way. Academics love to talk about the same thing using a thousand different terms. Um, but he talks about forgotten facts. And uh, specifically, one of the ones he mentions is that more Blacks are in prison today than were enslaved when the Civil War started. And I think it's important to think about what he means by forgotten facts and what forgotten facts are in the Berkshires today. What forgotten facts impact our landscape, impact our art, impact our environment in ways that we're not always cognizant of that might become a part of our unconscious. We don't question it. Um, but of course, if we're thinking about are the, white, are the Berkshires a white space? They're not a white space. Historically, they're not a white space. If we think about the Berkshires as so white, we're willfully misremembering histories that are important for our nation, for our state, for the world. Um, and I just want to give you a couple. So I'm sure you all are familiar with my bad or, or Elizabeth Friedman. Um, this um, monumental uh, woman, she was born in upstate New York um, and she was enslaved um, by whites and she fought, she um, fought for her, for her freedom in, in the case of Broom and Bet versus Ashley. And she fought by saying the um, 1790 Massachusetts census says that, you know, people have rights and privilege and freedoms, um, so do I. And she won and, and her case was used as precedent in the future for other individuals. Um, so she found that, uh, or the, the ruling was that she had a constitutional right to liberty and it implicitly ended slavery in the United States. And um, she was in Sheffield as well as Stockbridge. Another individual super important from the Berkshires is Liu Kim Gong. Um, he, at the age of 16, moved from uh, San Francisco to the Berkshires, to North Adams specifically. And so um, this is actually a picture of a mural that's in um, uh, Tampa, Florida. And he created, he's a horticulturist, and he created this um, hybrid orange that's drought resistant, but also sweet. It's a variety of like the Valencia orange. Um, his story, right, of coming 
to North Adams is also indicative. I, I am a, I'm a historian of um, immigration um, and labor as well. And his story really pinpoints an important part of US immigration history, which is it really wasn't until um, Chinese labor came to the East Coast from the West Coast um, that we began to have uh, a real rallying cry of a lot of people for the Chinese Exclusion Act, which did not allow, um, which like completely shut off migration from China for the most part um, until China, the Chinese government was our ally during, during World War II. And we, as Congress officially, um, we had officially um, expressed regret in 2012, uh, quite a bit late. Uh, this political cartoon is contemporaneous. It comes out in, it's a Nash cartoon for those of you who are um, familiar with the illustration and the art of illustration. Um, in 1870, um, I was talking to a historian, a local his, uh, historian of um, this period in, in US immigration history. And he said that this is um, directly in um, relating to um, North Adams. I wasn't able to, in my research, I wasn't able to find a direct con con connection, but it is contemporaneous. Just to kind of show you, here are um, cartoons that I was able to find that are directly connected to North Adams, also contemporaneous in the same moment. So this is um, an illustration of the shoe factory that is at 16, um, that Lu Gim Gong came into North Adams to work in. Um, so here is a political cartoon and, he, and, and here's another one. So again, I, I'm really trying to focus also on the ways in which art creates these myths and symbols that shape the American experience and every experience. All right, I'm talking fast, but so that is all to say, to summarize that section, um, this idea of the Berkshires as a white space, I thought was really interesting um, in my conversation with Erica. So I just want to kind of think about my training in critical whiteness studies, what that made me think about, what histories that made me remember even more in thinking about this as a white space, because those histories are so important. Um, I mean, <laughs> the whole uh, citrus agricultural industry in Florida would not be what it is today, right? Um, the the work I most of my work is on um, I've only entered critical whiteness the good studies over the last four or five years most of my works in um, Latinx labor specifically Guatemalan Mayan indigenous migration and most of the first migration to the area that I region of the U.S. I focus to is Indian Town Florida right so that research wouldn't have even happened right um, so critical whiteness studies I want to talk a little bit about what this is as a field. Um, when you hear critical whiteness studies, people think that, you know, this field's about white people studying white people, but it actually has its origins in black radical thought. So um, my intellectual origins are in black radical thought, Chicana feminism. I'm focusing a little bit heavily in, in black radical thought here, um, but I just want to go over what uh, critical whiteness studies is um, and, and what works really kind of gave me an aha moment where I get, got that deeper understanding of um, power of privilege and what whiteness means. So to me as a, an academic, I believe race is a historically situated uh, social construct. So what I mean by that is it's created by humans, although the meaning changes over time. Whiteness itself to me um, is about power fundamentally. So the idea of whiteness as a racial category is relatively new. Within the United States, it really comes into play um, after emancipation within, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking heavily of like David Rodinger's work, Nolan Gobb, who writes about um, how the Irish became white, uh, how these scholars are, are talking about these moments in which um, white, poor whites are working the same jobs as, um, newly freed um, blacks and and they're, they're by overseers, there's a desire to create some sort of division between them so that, that people don't come together and create a union, gosh forbid, right? So um, this idea of whiteness to me is about power. And if I'm thinking about 
white, the Berkshires is a white space. It's about spatializing power, how we experience power geographically. In my work, I think about how we produce and police uh, whiteness rhetorically. So I think about whiteness as a rhetorical or a discursive um, construction. So these aha moments. I want you to think about this question and it'll come up at the end, but I want you to think a little bit about what the map of your artistic or intellectual awakening might look like. Because I'm going to tell you what mine is in terms of critical whiteness studies. Those moments where I was like, okay, Hannah, you, you need to think differently. And I'm able to think differently because of this work in Black radical thought. I'm extremely indebted to Black radical thought, to kind of feminism, Black feminism. Um, and so my intellectual awakening, I'm going to go over each of these, really come from a couple ideas that I use again and again throughout my work. A lot of it is influenced by um, Black Marxism. And um, so some of these ideas and concepts are the wages of whiteness, which I'm going to explain, uh, racial capitalism, racial contract, the theory of lived experience and intersectionality. So another um, uh, individual from um, Great Barrington in the Berkshires, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, super important in the founding of uh, critical whiteness studies, I would say uh, the founder. So in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, um, Du Bois writes that uh, whites have um, gained um, psychological and public wages. So what that means is that you gain social capital, but also um, an effective kind of, um, an effective benefit from um, white supremacy, but also from claiming a white identity. Um, so when you believe that you are white, right, you, you gain um, a benefit from, from being white. Um, this is something that David Rodinger um, in his book, um, whose name I will remember as soon as I stop talking about it, <laughs> um, um, he, he talks about the ways in which this psychological wage is also um, a literal wage. Uh, in working. Um, it also reminds me of um, Iodide's book, uh, The Emotional Politics of Racism, um, but much more contemporary, but she looks at like, why do white people vote in ways that is against their economic best interest? Well, a lot of it has to do with emotions and emotional politics and affect. Um, but that's not new. Du Bois did it over 100 years ago and came up with this idea, right? What are the affective benefits that I get through being a, a white woman in Berkshire County, through being a white professor in the classroom. Um, Cedric Robinson, super important um, to my intellectual awakening um, within critical uh, whiteness studies, specifically the idea of racial capitalism. And this very much intersects with um, the next individual that I'm gonna be talking about. But racial capitalism is this idea of the process of extracting social and economic value through racial or um, racial others, essentially. So um, people who are, are, are non-white. So we see this, uh, a lot of my work has been um, on uh, migrant labor. So we definitely see that there. I'm gonna show you some other examples throughout this presentation as well. Um, the racial contract, really, really important. So Charles Mills, this is the racial contract and uh, racial capitalism are intertwined. Um, so this is, the racial contract is a, um, it's a social contract that emphasizes post-race racism or color blindness. So the idea that um, race is no longer, um, some color blindness is the idea that race no longer influences someone's lived experience. So to notice race is therefore racist. Um, so the idea behind the racial contract is that most whites hoard educational, social, political resources and educational opportunities for themselves. And that while emphasizing individualism and stereotypes of a black underclass. So this is kind of other scholars. Um, Jody Melmed calls this neoliberal multiculturalism. It's very similar, this idea, if you're familiar with that term. And um, so Mills argues, therefore, a critical analysis of social structures will reveal de facto racism. So racism that is not law, like de jour, um, but just kind of the way it is. And so a lot of this intersects and interacts with um, this idea of racial capitalism and this reality, I would argue, of racial capitalism um, and how capitalism itself is reliant on an underclass. So you can't have equality in capitalism. Um, and that underclass is more often than not um, 
racial um, and ethnic um, members of like historically marginalized communities. Uh, and often, depending on geography, um, feminized labor as well. Specifically, I'm thinking of export processing zones. So to piggyback up of all, all of that, right? I mentioned feminized labor, export processing zones. So these are like free trade zones. Um, there's been a lot of really interesting work in free trade zones, like um, in the Caribbean, in um, like the, the Pacific region um, where the labor is feminized and, and oftentimes like meticulous work is done by women. Um, and this reminds me of the work of Audre Lorde in, in this quote, so there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives, right? Oh, sorry, my, my light fell off. Okay. Um, so what this means is it, it also is another way of thinking about this is um, what Kimberly Crenshaw termed intersectionality, right? So when we're thinking about race, we have to always think about class. We have to always think about gender. We always have to think about sexuality. We also have to think about geography. We have to think about um, all of these different dynamics of our identity, right? So <laughs> why I mentioned that is simply because um, I wanted to give you a brief map of my aha moments of why critical whiteness studies. I started off studying ethnic studies, but I realized when I was studying ethnic studies, I was studying representations of uh, Guatemalan Mayans and it, in the US media and how they were always misrepresentations. What I was really studying was a repertoire, a racialized regime of representation, as Stuart Hall would call it, of whiteness and how whiteness uses um, the identity politics or the identities of historically marginalized communities in, in, in perpetuating its own um, racial project. And what I mean by that is that whiteness kind of has to have the other um, and functions largely through being normative. So this kind of goes back to this um, overlooked history or forgotten histories. So I want to think a little bit about that in the context. Of, I'm going to try to be done as soon as, as I can. I know that there, there's going to be a lot of discussion. But this goes back to this idea of myths and symbols and kind of connecting it also to artwork, representation. Representation really matters. Aesthetics matter. They make, um, I think that art, Art to me is always activism. They're, they're, they're connected to me the way I envision um, art. And it, thinking about the myths in the ways art with an image can disrupt stereotypes, can disrupt systems, um, and kind of can give light to um, institutions, to understanding oppression in a much deeper way. And I'm gonna give you kind of an example of what I mean by that in a moment. So, Myths and symbols. One of the big myths and symbols that you hear within my field, um, American Cultural Studies, is the, the frontier, which is Frederick Jackson Turner comes up with this idea of the frontier thesis. So this is a, a treatise that he writes uh, the late 1800s. And in it, he argues around uh, that the frontier is essentially what makes um, Americans unique. That we have this ever-expanding land, he, he completely forgets indigenous populations, he perpetuates American exceptionalism, um, uh, individualism, manifest destiny. Another way to kind of think about how does art interpret this frontier thesis, uh, it, it's more complex, but this painting, which many of you are probably familiar with, is I would say um, sometimes we see it as manifest destiny, or you might see it in a textbook as manifest destiny. Um, but it's American Progress. It's from 1872 and it's John Gast. So we have a lot of 1870s going around here. So in this image, we see um, a representation uh, contemporaneous um, at this, around the same historical moment as Frederick Jackson Turner and his thesis. Um, and it kind of shows this white woman, um, you know, bringing like civilization to the the west right progress in in terms of settlers um settler colonialism um and the railroad etc i mean you can talk about this in our um breakout groups but what i'm interested in and what i what really kind of like gets me excited is something like this so this is um in the section of um alberto 
um, Ladzama, Ladima's book, um, Diary of a Reluctant Dreamer. Uh, he has this section, a chapter called um, the, the alpha, Undocumented Alphabet. So he is a formerly undocumented activist and, and scholar. And he um, created this image that's a direct play or um, kind of repurposing this canonical image that is associated with manifest destiny. So we see like, I mean, you, you can look at, I'm not gonna <laughs> like read it for you. But what I think is really cool here is that he's taking this canonical image, right? And he is taking it into a contemporary moment and really um, playing with power, with representation. So we have Ann Coulter, right? This um, white woman leading this. And, and this is something that I just, I just wrote an article um, about white women and their role in, in white supremacy and um, complicity and a lot of, there's a lot, been a lot of work post-Trump on, on white male pain and kind of the ways in which white men um, push uh, like white supremacy, but there's less done on women. So I, I just finished a piece on this. So I couldn't get this image out of my head. And I think this is so humble. And, and to me, this is more than a doodle. And Ladima um, talks about the ways in which I mentioned earlier, so art can make, give you a complex idea that's accessible. So uh, he was teaching high school students and he talks about this in the book. And he says that he wanted to teach his students what it was like to be a dreamer for a day. And he was lecturing and they were bored with the lecture. I'm sure you're bored with me. And so he created an image, what he called a doodle. And he, it was in the moment he realized like the students got it. They were engaged, they wanted to talk about it. It was art, right? It's art and it was able, they were able to understand more um, how complicated it was to be a dreamer, um, to be an undocumented student, going to college, um, living on someone's couch, right? And it was through art that this complicated message that he wanted to show that he could have lectured hours and about was shown. They, people got it. Um, and it's also an example of what I call artists flipping the script. So some people who write about this, who write about representations, artists embodying um, a stereotypical image, right? In order to kind of deconstruct uh, um, oppressive powers. Um, Stuart Hall calls this transcoding. So I would say this is an example of like, so how do we em embody this that, that is kind of oppressive? How do historically marginalized populations do that in a way that kind of usurps the power structure? And I think artists do this very well. Um, Similar to this, like specific to like the Latin American Latinx experience, um, Frances Aparicio and Susanna Chavez Silverman um, call this a retropicalization. So a tropicalization kind of being the corollary to Orientalism, uh, tropicalism being corollary to Orientalism, and retropicalization would be kind of to um, embody uh, a stereotype to deconstruct it. And, and I have an example of that, which I will note as a retropicalization. So some of the questions I have are about um, these two terms. And um, so transcoding is kind of like more general. Uh, retropicalization specifically refers to like hemispheric uh, Americas. So, um, but you can think about it as just like artists kind of flipping a dominant narrative on its head in order to de deconstruct it, which I think is so powerful. So, uh, I'm, I'm almost there. So um, point five, and so this is our, my last one, is myth making. So race, power, and the white US racial imagination. So I wanted to bring this back to the Berkshires. So I've talked, I tried to bring in some art and bring it back to the Berkshires. And another person um, who he happens to be, I think from Pittsfield, um, but so Drew Lupinzina is um, uh, a scholar of indigenous heritage. So I grew up right off Route 2. So this is very much, this part of the lecture is very much inspired by this. I grew up right on the Mohawk Trail. Um, so Lopenzina comes up with this idea called um, unwitnessing, which was kind of, it was one of those aha moments again for me. And unwitnessing is the absolute absence in the colonial archive of native viewpoints. It's a type of cultural amnesia that allows whites to witness the impact of white supremacy on native people, but also unwitnessed this experience in a dominant historical memory. 
So I wanted to take some time to think about how we unwitness indigenous history in, um, in Berkshire County in ways that are kind of like really personal to, to my experience. Um, I'm gonna begin thinking about Massachusetts more expansively and also the history in the US of, of white people playing Indian. So Phil Deloria has an amazing book that was really monumental um, about playing Indian. And really, if we're gonna think about one of the earliest phase uh, examples of playing Indian, it would be um, this etching of, of the Boston Tea Party, right? So white people putting on um, what they believe to be <laughs> indigenous apparel um, and, and, and having certain like um, tribal affiliations, names, et cetera, in order to embody um, an identity that's quintessentially American that allows them to distance themselves from being European. What about, it's kind of this embodying of the stereotype of the noble savage um, here. And, and also this idea of anonymity as well. It's very popular at this point. We have Pocahontas societies um, in, in early American history. I'm thinking like the 1800s, 1700s, Pocahontas societies and other fraternal organizations. So Pocahontas would be women, but there's other societies like the Society of Red Men, which are white people, fraternal organizations. They still exist where white people enact rituals based very loosely on what they believe to be indigenous experience. Why do I mention this? Um, well, uh, you probably have seen Hail to the Sunrise, right? This is um, in Chalamat, uh, down, down the valley in Chalamat, right after my mountain. And so this is a, a building that was, uh, our building, <laughs> a statue that was put up in 1932. And it was by, it says, Hail to the Sunrise in memory of the Mohawk Indian. The Mohawks of the five nations began to settle in New York State in, in 1590. And for 90 great sons, they fought the New England tribes. The New York Mohawks that traveled this trail were friendly to the white settlers, erected by the tribes and councils of the Improved Order of Red Men. The Improved Order of Red Men is a group of white men. <laughs> um, so you can kind of think about all the symbolism, the ideological work that's done by that. This statue is also the image of um, the Mohawk Trail scenic byway. So all around Route 2, you see this image again and again and again. And a lot of people might think, oh, this is honoring indigenous people. But I, th I think we need to think a little bit deeper about what does this say, right? So friendly to the white settlers. This is about, this is a monument to, to to whiteness, I, I think. Um, and uh, so just to give you a little bit order, more information about this improved order um, of red men. These are some of their symbols on the slide and, and examples here. So they were established in 1834. Um, so it's a fraternal order whose um, rituals and regalia are modeled after white stereotypes of um, indigenous dress. So it's very, it's one of many examples of fraternal organizations that um, played Indian as Deloria calls it. So they still have a website if you're interested in checking it out. Um, if we're gonna remember this area, uh, my partner is a, um, a historian of Creek um, uh, history. So Creek people around like what today is um, like Athens, Georgia, um area so when he came the first thing he's like why is this the mohawk trail the mohawks weren't here it's um places where mohicans were here uh it's actually mohican mohawk trail um, but we we call it the um the mohawk trail and this is a really cool website I, i'm going to bring it up a little bit later but you can go and you can see um what ha what indigenous land, what treaties, what languages were spoken where you are, so you can map this everywhere. And I did this for um, I did this for NA. They also talk a little bit on this website about um, a territorial acknowledgement, right? So acknowledging like the Mohican were were the people that were here um, prior to U.S. settler colonialism. So um, in remembering right when we came. Um, I kind of, this ties in, but it also ties in with what I, I mentioned before about uh, re-tropicalization. So if you happen to be here earlier, I mentioned that I almost went to grad school for performance studies. I was interested in using um, 
Boal's idea of legislative theater within communities in, or in and around Indian Town, Florida, because Guatemalan Mayan, the indigenous people that I was really interested in um, working with, they, they spoke Canabal, which is a, a oral dialect, right? And then some people spoke Spanish, some people spoke English. So I was kind of interested in the ways in which embodiment in performance could be a way to create and foster community dialogue and um, belonging. Um, I didn't end up doing that project. I, I went to a different program. But um, this is an example of retropicalizations. Again, flipping the script. So I kind of wanted to end with a dominant narrative and, and a flipping of the script. This is, um, uh, you probably are familiar, 1992-93, um, uh, Guillermo Gomez Pena and Coco Fusco um, came out with this piece, Couple in the Cage. Um, it is talked about by Chavez and Lerman and Aparicio as a re-tropicalization, so embodying tropes of tropical, tropicalisms, the ways in which the West trope um, individuals from Latin America um, and Northern um, America as well. So I want to just play this little clip so you can kind of see what this looks like, this piece. I study a lot of the Indians. I do a lot of traveling out west, mm -hmm. and I study a lot about the Indians, but this is one tribe uh, that I didn't know of. I, I have no idea what they're talking. I asked whether they were Mayans, and they said that they didn't know. I just find it really strange. I've never heard about it. Yeah. Um, I've been in Guatemala, and I read a lot about like American Indians, and I've never heard about it. So, Couple in the Cage is a piece um, that happened at the, the 500 year um, moment of um, the colonization of the Americas by Christopher Columbus. And so, Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gómez Peña, they're playing um, the role of undiscovered American Ameri Indians. Like, there's this, um, they created this, this narrative that there's this undiscovered island and they have certain um, certain things like a TV and sneakers because they washed it on shore. They, they're talking, they're making critiques about um, museums as colonial imperial spaces. They're, they're making critiques about um, the idolization of uh, Columbus in, in world culture. And um, some people actually believed, and as you can see by those interviews, some people really believed um, the story. So they're, they're this, of this couple in a cage. And they're also making a critique of tying back to Frederick Jackson Turner. He gave his thesis at um, a World Columbian exhibition in the United States. And at that exhibition, um, individ indigenous people from Fiji, from Hawaii, um, Sardi Bardem from um, South Africa, uh, were on display in cages. So they're also talking about the history of literally um, having his, like members of historically marginalized communities, people of color, in cages for, for white people's amusement. So this is an example of a retropicalization. Um, so embodying this to, to deconstruct, to, to critique these systems. Okay. So, I wanted to end you with you with uh, a, a couple questions, or rhetorical questions. What does it mean to willfully or to misremember the past? So in remembering, starting off with the first question um, that kind of Erica gave me, what does it mean to, to remember or think of the, the Berkshires as a white space? Um, you're misremembering a lot of the past, right? And, and what does it mean to do that? What does it mean, what, what type of ideological work when you act on that? What does it do? What impact does it have? Um, so this is a, a flag that's profoundly racist. My better half um, lived, was a, a professor in Mississippi for a spell. Um, and this is the Mississippi State flag. Um, this is one, uh, I think we could agree, a, a very racist flag. Um, this flag is also extremely racist, um, but we don't always think twice about it. So this is a Massachusetts state flag. Uh, there has been, um, this is just another example of like 
representations around us we might not always think twice about. So I have an image of an indigenous person with a sword above their head, um, with a, um, a fist with a sword, right? And then we have um, a, a piece underneath it that says, uh, by the sword we seek peace. So um, this is a lot of information for a slide, but you can download this at uh, changethemassflag.com. Um, not to not to preach, but um, I think it's important to think about the ways in which the Massachusetts flag is also a symbol of white supremacy, just like the Mississippi flag. Um, sometimes we don't think about white supremacy or will trope or stereotype white supremacy, racism on um, rural people and particularly Southerners as well. Uh, I think it's important to think um, the ways in which images of white supremacy are all around us um, and we may not even notice it. They're on your license, maybe. Um, so we, I, again, you, you can um, read this, you can um, take a screenshot, download it. But uh, this is a map of um, places in Massachusetts that have or have not um, adopted this resolution. Here, I should go back. Um, oops, a daisy, sorry about that. Um, so this, this is talking about um, State Bill 2848, right, to change the Massachusetts flag because of this symbology, which is something like amazing artists could, could really rally behind. Um, but here's places, cities, and towns that have passed resolutions in support of changing the flag, towns and cities that have unanimously passed resolutions in support of, um, have unanimously passed them, and then ones that have not passed resolutions. Um, and then there's a lot that have done nothing, including my town of Florida, including North Adams, Williamstown, Pittsfield, et cetera. So um, there is, like I said, you can check out the website um, and kind of think about, again, just the ways, symbols, myths, um, just kind of double thinking them. So I wanted to end with uh, a couple questions for breakout rooms. So one is, I think it's fun, like doing this exercise of mapping my own intellectual awakening and in, in terms of like why I, why I find critical whiteness studies so um, important and, and really helps open my eyes around structures of oppression and understanding them. Um, so I think it might be interesting to map your own artistic and or intellectual awakening. And here are other questions that I, I just wanted to put, put forward, I thought, for discussion in the breakout rooms. So what does it mean to misremember the past for you and your career and your art? What myths and symbols do you see or use that represent complicated racial histories? And how do you see transcoding or retropicalizations or another form of flipping the dominant narrative in the art world today? So again, embodying stereotypes to deconstruct them. Um, and we know from the couple in the cage, right? Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. So you play a risk there sometimes. And what does it mean to produce artwork for social change? Um, all right, so that is my presentation. Thanks, Hannah, and thank you so much for taking the time and and kind of contextualizing both this area, but also I know it putting the art spin on it was was a different different component for you. Um, but I, I think you did great. Um, so I think now, um, so we've got how many of us here? We have 15 people here. Um, Brianna, are you thinking three groups? What are you? Yeah, we're just on that line where yeah. I think if we go to three groups, the groups might feel a little bit small, especially if anybody slips away as we're getting into groups. So I'm, I was just going to go with two. Okay, that sounds good. So we'll break into two groups. Um, and so each group will have multiple members of the, the coalition. And so we we all have copies of these, um, these questions uh, that we can, can talk about. Um, but, you know, we'll see where the conversation takes us. And um, I know I've jotted down a lot of really exciting things. Um, and yeah, then we'll come back together and, and talk about what we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I have volunteered myself to just coordinate our little report backs. And I know it's kind of funny because there's just two groups. Um, but uh, with the time that we have left, I'm going to attempt to just kind of share what my half of the of the room sort of talked about with our other half and whoever was in the conversation with me please feel free to jump in i like scratched some notes but we really spent a good amount of time talking about 
our own creative and intellectual awakenings. And a lot of uh, people's answers to that was about these lived experiences and experiencing new environments and meeting new people and just having that kind of awareness, at least the white folks in the room. Um, and uh, um, yeah, just, ex just experiencing new things outside of the bubble because within our white bubbles, we were told the story that we believed. And then once we left the bubble, there was obviously a new story. Um, and uh, let's see, um, then we sort of talked about these myths and images and things that we didn't really realize were helping to tell that story and started to break down those experiences. Um, and then also pointing to intersectionality and how that really helped encourage an awakening and how almost translating white supremacy to capitalism or economic structures or that idea of the white wage and social capital hoarding of power. I realize I'm kind of just saying a lot of buzzwords from Hannah's presentation, but um, it really sort of helped distill these ideas of, of aligning our ideas of equity and white supremacy with actual actions and what it actually means to to give up that power and to um, achieve justice for folks who might be marginalized or, or in oppressed communities. Um, so that's the real quick cliff notes. Uh, does anyone in my group have anything to add to that or want to correct me on anything I said? No? Okay, cool. Um, so who from the other half of the room want to share from their group? We didn't pick anyone. I, I've been talking a lot. So does anyone else want to volunteer in our group? Seems like a tag team if, if you oh, want. Uh, you start. Okay. <laughs> well, um, we started the conversation uh, Sweens kind of started off um, talking about symbols in our kind of immediate community um, that that we realize aren't really productive in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We were thinking, Sweens, you brought up the Hoosick Tunnel um, about you know that that's our city logo essentially, and how. Uh, the Hoosick Tunnel is this thing that is that that has been praised for this, you know, this kind of achievement of engineering, but all of the Chinese and Irish immigrants who built this thing that is so widely celebrated are are not honored as much as they should be. It's kind of it's kind of um, swept under the rug. And then we started um, Carolyn was mentioning the that that really cool map that Hannah showed in her presentation uh, regarding Massachusetts state flag and um, about you know, different areas in Massachusetts that have like ability to change it. Um, you know, she mentioned that growing up in the Pioneer Valley, it was it was like Becky was saying before this bubble. Sierra, sorry, can you get a little closer to the computer for- Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. For audio, thanks. I'm lost, I'm lost in my thoughts and talking quieter. Um, but we were essentially talking about all of these, all of these bubbles. Um, Carolyn mentioned going up to the Valley and being in and then, and then thinking that everything is okay and then escaping that bubble like Becky was, was kind of chatting about in, in her group. Um, and, uh, yeah, just means, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, uh, I think we also talked a lot about um, our aha moments as mm -hmm. well. And, you know, moments that where we, you know, sort of assumed or, or not assumed necessarily, but just learned about deeper, you know, deeper white whiteness awareness that was around us that maybe we assumed wasn't necessarily there um and are we missing anything we're in a very hot space yeah we're so like my brain like, isn't working oh you know well. what we also talked about we also talked about how um we talked about like the symptoms or side effects of whiteness mm -hmm. which is 
uh, the symptom or side effect of whiteness, whatever you want to call it, is just a temporary solution to a problem. I, I think I gave a flat tire analogy of getting a flat tire and then having the donut that you stick on be be on it forever. You know, that's not a sustainable solution to that problem. You're going to have to get a new tire eventually. It just takes a little bit more effort. And we were talking about whiteness specifically in the Berkshires, how, how there is a lot of temporary solutions to these problems and for an equitable, sustainable future, that's that narrative has to change. Um, did I miss anything? I'm still muted. Okay, thank you, Sierra and Sweets for sharing. Um, I just wanted to uh, point everyone just to the chat. Molly shared um, AIC's Anti-Racism Accomplice Support Group. The link to register for that is there in case you're interested. Um, and then just wanted to give a really deep thank you to Hannah for joining us um, for this community conversation. We were so thankful to have her join us for this series. Um, and I think her presentation was a really good add on to all the conversations we had been having. So thank you, Hannah. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Of course. And thank you all for coming. Uh, this will get posted to the AIC YouTube channel. So if you have friends or colleagues who you think would benefit from seeing um, the first half of the, of the event, the breakout groups weren't recorded, but the first half of the presentation that will be posted there. And I don't know if I'm missing anything, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Oh, Swains. I'm sorry, I just wanted to add because I think this is a, a thing I brought up in our group, um, but if anyone is interested in maybe adopting a resolution to support the changing of our state flag, I am a city councilor and have the power to help make that happen. So please email me sweeney.namacouncil at gmail.com. Uh, the more community support I have for adopting that resolution puts more pressure on the rest of the room in supporting it. Um, so I think that is, uh, that's wrong. That, that's um, the wrong. Okay. Sweeney.nama at gmail.com. Nama. Council at gmail.com. Council. Um, yeah. The more people we have doing that together helps. Is that um, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Awesome. No, thank you so much. That's great. That would be awesome. And Hannah, I just wanted to ask if it'll be possible for you to share your slides, because there was so much great content on there that I know I could use more time to digest. We'd be happy to distribute those to everybody if you're able to share them. Yeah, I can share them with Erica. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah, this was amazing. Thanks so much, Hannah. I think it was, I think it's a great starting point. I definitely think Hannah should come back. We should all talk more about this. I think that, you know, we're, we're skimming the surface, but I hope everybody had really great conversations, but thanks, Hannah. And thank no problem. Yeah, and thank you all for coming tonight on a beautiful day, spending some time on Zoom, but now <laughs> you can go outside and enjoy it. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.